is amazing. It's so wonderful to be here. So I want to start off with a quote. So this quote is from the founder of Taoism. When I let go of what I think I am, I become what I might be. So this is a photo of me as a little girl at the age of four. I look pretty happy, don't I? And then uh, my little brother came along and uh, you can see by the expression on my face, I'm not very impressed, right? <laughs> Only joking, bro, I love you. I was, I was really happy at this age. And it didn't necessarily have to do with the environment that I was being raised in, even though I was raised with loving parents. It's because at this age, I had no real sense of who I thought I was. So I didn't want for anything, uh, even though I grew up with very poor parents. For the most part, I lived in the now, so I didn't dwell on the past or, or worry about the future. I was this little human being, completely unrestricted by my mind, with an open heart that loved animals so much. And at this stage in my life, anything was possible for me. That is until the madness started to set in. And what do I mean by madness? And by the way, all of you have a degree of this madness within you. <laughs> so strangely enough, as a conservation scientist, I've always been uh, fascinated by the human animal. I mean, we're arguably the most intelligent of all species, although to watch the news, uh, I seriously wonder <laughs> every day. But we've evolved these large brains with a, a large cerebral cortex capable of higher thought processes such as reasoning, abstract thought and, and decision making. And these brains of ours are particularly good at survival because we can see ourselves as a separate entity, as, as a self, with a past, a present and a future. But the problem with this sense of self which is conditioned by our past, so our, our families, our culture, our traumas, can be particularly destructive, not just to ourselves, but to others, other beings, and to the planet as a whole. So here I was, this little four-year-old, with an open heart who just wanted to save animals. But slowly, negative experiences were starting to happen to me. And this... These were giving me a very warped and deluded view of who I thought I was and my ability to really make a difference in the world. And we can all, we can all think of times or a time in our life that impacted the way we think about ourselves and the world around us. I mean, how often have we said to ourselves, if only, you know, I could get this job, if only this thing could happen to me, then I would be happy. It doesn't even have to be something that is, that is particularly significant. So in my life, for example, when I was teased at school, I was taught that I was not likeable. When I was kicked out of home, I was taught that I was not lovable. And when I was sexually abused, I was taught that I was not worthy. This was my madness, or my deluded mind as I like to call it. And this deluded mind then can impact our emotions and our motivations, severely affecting who we think we are and the impact that we can make in the world. Because we depend upon our past for our, our identity and, and our future for our fulfillment. So we're never actually living in the present moment. And it is the present moment, this very place right here, that our limitless potential lies. So my ambition, rather than coming from a place of genuine love and compassion, it was, it was actually coming from my sense of worthlessness. How much of what motivates you in your life is based on a sense of inadequacy or resentment or fear or anger. I 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I've had a complete mental blank. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry. This is so emotional for me. I mean, this is, this is, this is my personal journey, and I appreciate you, uh, your patience with me. So I guess I was the, the classic overachiever uh, in my life. And what I mean by that is I tried to achieve as much as I possibly could in order to compensate for that lack of, that lack of self-worth. And I, I didn't realize this at the time, of course. I thought that my motivation was purely based on uh, a genuine feeling of love and compassion, right? So I, I had this double degree in um, zoology and botany. I was an international model and an actress in Australia. I managed a marsupial project, a marsupial behavior project that taught little wallabies like this, like this quokka how to recognize and cope with our introduced predators. I was a presenter on US Discovery Channel for, for two years, traveling the world, and uh, it, was a, it had a huge cult following. And I also co-directed a documentary uh, which filmed the devil facial tumor disease, which is currently killing Tasmanian devils in the wild. So I'm not showing you this to big note myself. I'm just trying to make a point here that to look at this, you would think that I would be happy, wouldn't you? And to look back at this myself, I just cannot believe how absolutely miserable I was. In fact, I was so miserable that I was deeply depressed to the point of suicide. I mean, how can this be? I mean, these were, these were goals that I absolutely wanted. It was because my ambition was being motivated by a place of fear, which came from my lack of self-worth. And my depression came about when the production company actually went bankrupt, and this was after filming Tasmanian Devils in the wild for two years. I was found by the police, collapsed in the Tasmanian bush at night with hypothermia. So not only was my delusional mind affecting my career and my happiness, it was now threatening my very survival. So I needed to do something really, really drastic, and that's when I decided to meditate. Yep, I decided to meditate. For me, it was a complete revolution. It made so much sense to me, and in, that 10 day, in those 10 days, I saw the changes that were coming about in my mind. And it had such a phenomenal influence on my life that I then went on to do three, three-month retreats in Nepal and Thailand. <laughs> And I know, I mean, a lot of people have said to me that I'm crazy, or I was crazy, and uh, that I was losing my mind, but that's kind of the idea. <laughs> but uh, I, I was so interested, based on that, the first 10-day retreat, in what happens to the mind when we meditate for, for long periods of time like this. And what I discovered, and I'm, I'm going to oversimplify here, is, but what I discovered was we are not our thoughts and our feelings. They are entities that are not permanent. They rise and they pass. And secondly, when you meditate for this long and thoughts disappear, and they don't disappear because you're bored, they just simply disappear, what is left is a bliss and a sense of love and compassion that is just unfathomable. And now that I was sitting in this place of love and compassion, and this was the first time this had happened to me since I was that little four-year-old girl, the deluded, limiting mind was no longer in control of me because I saw it for what it was, and they were just thoughts that pass. And it opens up that love and compassion, and when you sit in that love and compassion, Suddenly, you don't care about what happens to you for your happiness. You're simply open 
to things that present themselves to you, whether they be positive or negative, as opportunities. And from this, opportunities started to arise for me. So I then went on to do my PhD with the Australian Antarctic Division on the population genetics of South Pacific and Australian humpback whales. And this was an area of conservation that I had absolutely no experience in. But I was fascinated by this incredible method that uses DNA as a tool because it helps us to study uh, rare and elusive species like whales. And it was as if the project kind of found me rather than me trying to find the project. Um, and it was, it was a dream PhD. So I got to... Uh, go down to the Southern Ocean near Antarctica and get up close to these amazing animals that use this part of the Southern Ocean to feed during the southern summertime. And from this charismatic species, it opened up a whole new world of conservation to me. And then I then went on to study Antarctic blue whales. And this was a species I had wanted to see ever since I was that little four-year-old girl. And believe me, when you get up close to the largest animal that has ever lived, it is something that never leaves you for your entire life. I mean, this will stay with me forever. And that's when I knew that it was time to quit. <laughs> yep, I, I decided it was time to quit. Why did I decide that it was time to quit? Because I'd stumbled across a method that could potentially revolutionise conservation. And this is actually a method developed by a biomedical lab here at McMaster for the detection of bacteria in food and water samples. And I saw this method and I thought, my gosh, it could, I could develop a handheld device for wildlife detection. So using this device to detect wildlife from fecal samples, from bone, from skin, basically anything containing DNA. And this device would enable us to detect wildlife very quickly, easily, and cheaply. And this is very important in conservation because it allows us to, to um, determine threats of extinction very quickly, and we can track the illegal trade in wildlife parts. Um, illegal wildlife trade is, de is decimating species all over the world and threatening biodiversity. So this was big. This was, this was huge. And so because my limiting delusional mind wasn't getting in the way anymore, I, I didn't hesitate to quit whale research, travel to the other side of the world, away from my family and friends, and start to work on this with the lab at McMaster. And this was on very little money, and this was, a, this was an area I was completely unfamiliar with. I mean, this is biomedical for research, for goodness sake. <laughs> and uh, not only that, I decided that I was going to choose the most difficult species in the world to study, to develop this technology. I chose the snow leopard. Why did I choose the snow leopard? Well, you, you have to admit they're pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, what's not to like about these animals? They're, 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 they're phenomenal. But really, they are one of the most rare and elusive species in the world, so they need this technology so that we can learn more about them and protect them. They're, they're vulnerable to extinction. There's less than 7,500 left ranging across the Himalayas between Afghanistan and China. Now, I won't lie. This was probably the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. It still is the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. It's been incredibly lonely and very daunting, uh, having to raise, having to try and find a million dollars to bring on a team of experts to help make this happen. And in the past, before I started meditating, I would have clung to the outcome of this. I would have wanted this to happen with, at all costs because my self-worth was on the line. But because I sit today more in a place of love and compassion, the outcome doesn't really matter so much. And this then opens me up to, to, to opportunities that I'd never consider. And so what started off as an idea for the detection of snow leopards 
has now expanded to include so many species around the world and for different applications. So detecting wildlife in the field from their fecal samples, detecting the illegal trade in wildlife parts, even detecting wildlife diseases such as the chytrid fungus, which is decimating frogs and other amphibians around the world. I even have commercial opportunities that could enable me to fund conservation projects well into the future. The possibility of starting my own NGO or, or, or company. And just recently, I've had a production company actually interested in filming the journey to create this technology. So these, I mean, I'm still blown away by all this. These, these are things that I would never have considered particularly when my limited delusional mind was in control. So how, how can we live in a place of love and compassion, um, of abundance and peace? How can we do this? Well, you, you could go and meditate in a cave for a year and uh, renounce everything. Or if you're soft and lack the phenomenal discipline that I am, <laughs> that I have, should I say, there are three tools that I use on a daily basis that has really helped me to, to tame the mind. The first is to just understand that what you believe about yourself is not what is ultimately true. The second is meditate, 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 even if it's just for five minutes out of every day. And what meditation does is it, it, it brings you into the present moment more on a daily basis. And you get to sit there and look at your thoughts and your feelings like a scientist for what they really are, rather than what your delusional mind interprets them to be. And finally, practicing gratitude. And this is a big one for me. So no matter what is happening in our lives, we can always find something to be grateful for. And what practicing gratitude does is it, it fills us, it, it, it brings us into a place of abundance. And if you already have abundance within you, then it stands to reason that you will attract abundance outside of you. So this is where I believe is our true capacity for making a difference in the world for we cannot effectively address the madness of the planet until we address our own. Thank you. Thank you so much.